Welcome back to Introduction to C++. My name is Kate Gregory and I'm introducing you to the most popular general purpose programming language, C++. In this module, it's time to finally tackle the most scary part of C++, pointers. Now you've seen you can write useful and powerful C++ applications without pointers. We've written a lot of code and covered a lot of ground in a completely pointer-free way. In fact, if you have pointers or difficult stories from other people or memories of your own, you know, they're based on how C++ used to be written. That said, it is time to see what pointers are, what they're for, how you can have long-lived objects in your applications, and why it's not as bad as people have told you. This is also the place to discuss references and the const keyword. So let's get started. Start with what a pointer, or for that matter a reference, actually is. They are variables, and a pointer is a variable that holds the address of another variable. You can then use the address to go kind of through the pointer to get to the original place that it was pointing to. You can change the pointer to point somewhere else, or you can go through it and use it to change the value that it points at. One way to get one is to take the address of an existing variable. So if you had some integer a, you could take its address with the address of operator, which is spelled capital 7, and that would return a pointer to that integer. You met the punctuation ampersand before when we were declaring references. There is a deliberate similarity. Their symbol is supposed to make you think of addresses and pointers and so on, but when the ampersand is before a variable, it means please take the address of this instance, this a. When the ampersand is at the end of a type, it means this is an integer reference or an employee reference or a bank account reference. So they're very different. Here, when we take the address of A, which is presumably an integer, we get an integer pointer. And you can spell integer pointer either int star, all one word, or int space star. Actually, you can have as many bases as you want before and after the star, but these are the two most popular ways to do it. And I have to tell you, the compiler doesn't care which of these you do, but a lot of humans do. The way you read the first one is you say, I'm declaring an integer pointer called PA, and I'm initializing it with the address of that integer A. The way you read the second one is you say, an integer is the contents of PA, and I'm initializing PA with the address of A. I prefer the first one, but as I often say when I discuss this with people, I'm married to someone who prefers the second one, and we get on just fine. Don't get worked up about where the star goes. The fact is, when you see a star with a type, you're declaring a pointer. When you see an ampersand before an instance of a variable, you're taking the address of a variable, which gets you a pointer, which you can put in some other pointer variable. Now, once you have one, the way you use it, as I alluded, is with the star operator. So star PA means take that pointer and go follow that value. So if there was a numerical value, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 in PA, it would go to memory location 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and that's where it would put, in the sample you see here on the slide, it would put the value 5. So the pointer's still pointing to the same place, but we went through the pointer to get to its target. When the target is an object rather than an integer, you can imagine that you could go through the pointer to get to the object at the other end and then say dot and use some member function of the object that's being pointed to. And you can, in fact, do that. However, because of order of operations, you have to put a bracket around it. So you could say bracket star p bracket dot. And that would mean evaluate the pointer, go through the pointer to the memory that's there, and now dot, I want to call a member variable on that. That's kind of awkward, so you can also just use this arrow operator. And you get that by typing two characters, minus and the close angle bracket, or greater than. And generally people pronounce it points to or arrow. I've heard a couple people pronounce it at, but I don't care for that because I tend to use that to pronounce the open bracket of some function calls. You'll see pointers being used with both fundamental types like integers and with objects in the demo. One important aspect about a pointer is that they're not always initialized to be pointing to something. They're not always initialized with a value that is somebody's address. 
and it's up to you if you would like to give them the value that means not pointing to anything. We generally tend to refer to that as a null pointer. So if you just say integer pointer p, it has a number in it, the same as all the way back in the first few demos I did with fundamental types, if you just said int i, you know, there was random number in it, whatever bits happened to be in that memory before, but it's not useful, it's not a pointer and you can't use it. And it's very important if you're going to work with pointers that you get them assigned values when you first create them, even if that value is the hi, I don't point to anything value. Now you have some choices about what value to use for hi, I don't point to anything. You can actually get away with typing the number zero. The compiler will understand that that means something, and you can use that to test the pointer and make sure that it does point to something, because as you remember, zero is false and any other number is true. Better to use the all caps NULL. This isn't actually a language keyword, it's just a macro, something that a lot of people define in their applications. And by a lot of people, I mean everybody. I mean really everybody defines NULL to zero. And sometimes people stay up and argue and say, what if NULL was defined to three, then what? Ha ha, NULL is defined to zero, and that's that. But you know what, who cares? Because now in C++11, we have a language keyword, NULL pointer or null putter, as many C++ folks pronounce it, to kind of distinguish it from the ordinary English word null pointer. This keyword is perfect for saying this is a pointer that doesn't point to anything. And you can test it, and it will return false. A pointer that's got the value null pointer will return false when you say if the pointer. C++ got pointers from C, but it added its own capability references and references are in a lot of important ways much simpler than pointers you can think of it as an alias you can change a pointer to point to a different place you can point to a for a while and then start pointing to b references can't they get their targets set when they're declared and that's that anything you do to a reference you're actually doing to the target and you don't have to use different punctuation like star or points to you can just talk to it directly as though it were the original object. And for most people, that makes references a lot simpler. I will show you them both in action. Here's some sample code that just plays around with pointers. And I have to tell you that this demo suffers from the same problem that all first pointer demos suffer from, which is that it is utterly pointless. And I'm just going to confess that to you. I'm going to show you the mechanics and the syntax of how to get pointers and how to use them, but you would never do this. If you have a perfectly good integer A, you would just work with A. Why would you make a pointer to it and then go through the pointer? Where pointers become useful is when, for example, you pass them down to a function or you keep them in a member variable and then you use them again later. Then knowing how to go through the pointer to get what you want back from the original fundamental type or the original object is a useful thing to know. That sets up a lot of complexity for a first demo, so we do it all together. So hopefully this is pretty straightforward. I make myself an integer called a, print out its value, make a pointer to that very same integer by using the address of operator. And then I use the pointer star pa to change the value that the pointer points to, to 4. Since the pointer points to a, this also changes a's value to 4. There's only one piece of memory. You can just talk to it two ways. You can call it a, or you can call it star pa. And I make a different integer. And now I change my pointer PA to actually point to B. And of course, its name means nothing, right? So it's called PA, but now it points to B. So if I take the contents of PA and do a plus plus operator on them, B will be incremented from 100 to 101. So here, when we print out the contents of PA, it's going to print out 101 works with objects too. So here I make a person called Kate and a person pointer called pKate is equal to the address of that object Kate. And then this is kind of the long way. I can say the contents of pKate, wrap that in brackets and then dot set number and as you can see the compiler, I've got no error messages here. It knows that that is a person function. But I can also use the arrow notation. So here where I'm using a solid object Kate I use the dot notation, and here where I'm using the pointer pKate, I use the arrow notation. pKate points to get name. The same thing's going on over here with number. 
And then we have some references, uh, integer reference RA. Now, unlike a pointer, you can't just say, oh, I have this integer reference, and I'll tell you later what it points to. You have to say is equal to, in this case, A. Then if I change RA to 5, that will actually change A to 5, because RA is just an alias now for A. You saw this when variables were passed down to functions. The parameters were passed by reference, that when you changed the local variable inside the function, it actually changed the value of the parameter back in the calling code that would have been passed down by reference. That's what reference means, that you can kind of change the, another place, talking to it with this different name. You can have references to objects as well as to people. So here, I make a person reference to that same Kate object and call its set number, and then I can call its get name. And notice, because it's a reference, that I'm using dot notation, both for the gets and for the sets for all the member functions, which for many people is more readable than the pointer notation. Let's quickly run this just to prove that everything does what you think it will do. So A is 3. Let's just line these up. A is 3. When we make the pointer PA and then change its contents to 4, A becomes 4. We make the pointer PA now actually point to B. And then we increment it. When we print it out, PA becomes 100 that then got incremented to 101. So it's not touching A anymore. It's only now touching B because that's where the pointer points. With the objects, we have a 234 for my arbitrary number. And then using the pointer, we change it to 235. Print it out both ways. You get 235 both ways because they're, again, the same piece of memory no matter how you talk to them. When we set RA to be A, and then change RA to 5, and then print out A, A is now 5, because RA is just an alias for A. And similarly, when we make R Kate to Kate, and then set its number to 345, print it out, it prints out 345. I have code here that's commented out. And let's kind of go through and talk about how the compiler would help me if I absentmindedly wrote this code. Here, I declare a pointer, and it's sort of foreshadowing that it has the name bad pointer, and I don't set it to the address of anything. I just say, la la la, it's an integer bad pointer, and then I try to use it. I try to go through bad pointer and put three in there. Also down here, I try to go through bad pointer and get the value to print it out. If I run this, a bad thing happens. And specifically, the variable bad pointer is being used without being initialized. So we'll just put that to stop. I told you that when I read the code, but you also notice that it sort of blows up when the application runs, and that's a really bad plan. I can make this a little better if I initialize my bad pointer to null pointer. So C++ 11 feature, if you're not using Visual Studio 2010, you can't use null pointer, but Visual C++ 2010 Express understands this C++ 11 feature, so it's all set. Now, if I just make only this change and run it, things don't really get much better. After all, it still doesn't point anywhere, right? Right? So we do still, unfortunately, go boom. But you notice we're going boom in a nicer way. It's actually possible that we could send an error report. I'm not going to. And that this null pointer exception that I could handle. We haven't done exceptions yet, so I'm not going to dwell on that. What's really important about initializing your pointer to null pointer is that you can test for null pointer very compactly. So I can come here and say if bad pointer I'll use it otherwise I won't. If I run this code 
we don't blow up. The if kept me out of this block and prevented me from trying to dereference, that's what this process is called, prevented me from trying to dereference the bad pointer. Now, you might think, well, it was just the if that helped you out, so let's take the equals null pointer back away and run it again. We're back to the very bad thing. Setting it to null pointer is what enables me to test whether, in fact, it's a null pointer or not. When a pointer has the value null pointer, or null putter, as some people like to pronounce it, this if will return false and will be protected. When it has random in bits that happened to be in that location before, it won't be protected. Any non-zero number comes out as true, so the if bad pointer will say, oh yeah, we're good, and go in here and try to dereference the pointer, and then your program will blow up. So if you're going to use a pointer, you need to be sure that it was initialized. One way to be sure is to declare them and immediately give them a value, as you saw right here. But another way is to declare them and immediately give them the value null pointer, and then always check to see if they're null pointer or not before you use them. Let's uncomment some bad reference code now. Pretty much the same thing, but an important difference. There's red wigglies right here. There wasn't here. Compiler's fine with you just declaring pointers and not initializing them to anything. Let's put that back before I forget. It's not fine with you declaring a reference and not initializing it to anything. So you can't make this mistake. And there's no way to test, is this a null reference? Because there's no such thing as a null reference. References have to be initialized pointing to something real. And that's one of the ways that they are simpler, because you can't, oh, I have to initialize, I have to check if it's null yet. It's not optional. It will be initialized. It won't be null. You will be able to use it. That's also sometimes the reason why you can't use references, because sometimes you, you know things are optional and you don't know if they're set or not. When you can use references, I prefer to use them. They're simpler. You can use the dot notation instead of the arrow, and you don't have to check to see if they're null or not. But that's exactly why you also sometimes can't use them.